All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great week. We actually have two shows today. In this particular episode, we're just going to hit Sixers Warriors. Then I want to talk about some of the passive-aggressive LeBron stuff, and we're going to play a little game, a little hypothetical game about LeBron potentially leaving the Lakers. Then I have 10 mailbag questions that we're going to hit at the end of the show where we bounce around the entire league. Later today, I have Carter Rodriguez from the Chase Down Pod who covers the Cleveland Cavaliers after a big win against the Clippers on Monday night. And I think they've won something crazy like 15 of their last 19 games. So we're going to do a deep dive on the Cleveland Cavaliers later this afternoon. That'll be in a separate video that you guys can see later today. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel. It'd mean a lot to me if you guys would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button. Don't forget about our podcast feed, wherever you get your podcasts under hoops tonight. I also found out the other day it's really helpful for us if you leave a rating and a review on the podcast feed. So if you guys have some time for that, I would appreciate it. Don't forget about my Twitter feed at underscore Jason LT. That's where I put show uh, announcements as well as the film threads that I do in the morning. And the last but not least, keep dropping mailbag questions and those YouTube comments so we can keep hitting them throughout the season. All right. So I think the story of the Sixers Warriors game was the defense they played on Joel Embiid. Now, important caveat there. I thought Embiid looked super disengaged in this particular game. The dead giveaway was like he basically would never be physically aggressive. He was just looking to take jump shots. Uh, As a matter of fact, 13 of his 18 shots that he took in that game were jump shots. He basically just catch, and then the the Warriors would kind of press up on him, and then he'd kind of take a jab step jumper. And there's some weird stuff going on with Philly, not just uh, on the injury front, but also on the body language front. It's uh, a little weird. That said, I want to give the Warriors some credit. They were swarming. Uh, specifically, one of the things you saw both Kevon Looney and Draymond Green do is chest up Joel Embiid with their arms out wide to the side, basically making it so that they could play like physical ball pressure without actually risking fouling on those reach in, you know, because Joel Embiid's always like digging those arms out in front of him in a weird kind of like jump shot, uh, a gather to try to draw fouls, right? And that's the, one of the most important parts of guarding Embiid is contesting those shots without fouling. And then from there, it's like digging down into driving lanes and swarming him, especially when he puts the ball on the floor and turns his back. And they were doing a great job every single time MB did put the ball on the floor by reaching in from behind. Jonathan Kaminga got a few steals in particular. They actually forced him into eight turnovers overall. I think he was like five for 18 from the field. Just an excellent defensive performance from the Golden State Warriors. And, you know, Draymond Green, I thought, played a big part in this. I thought he did just an incredible job on Joel Embiid and the possessions he was on him. And I think a lot of times, like, one of the things that we gloss over in the uh, in the NBA postseason is the capability that your roster has to make real significant impact on opposing stars because like when you really look back like let's just take a look at the 2022 postseason run for example and point out some specific examples of the way the Warriors defense didn't just do a good job but actually led players to having struggles in 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 real ways so for instance like in that first series against the Denver Nuggets. There was a big play, I think in Game 5, if I remember correctly, where Nikola Jokic was, I think it was actually Game 4 when they went up 3-1. I can't remember exactly which game it was. But do you guys remember, it was a one-possession game late. Nikola Jokic was attacking Draymond Green in the post on the left block. And Draymond Green actually got a reach-around steal on him. Like, how many players do you know that are capable of going on an island against one of the top five players in the league in a big moment and picking them clean? And that's what Draymond Green brings to the table as like a transcendent defensive option, right? And then looking at the Dallas Mavericks series between Andrew Wiggins' ball pressure, the good job they did on the back line, helping without helping too much off of shooters. Like, Luka put up statistical numbers, but he was nowhere near as... uh, He put up box score numbers, but he wasn't as impactful as an offensive initiator in that series. In fact, he was down a significant level from where he was in the Phoenix Suns series. And That's an example of what that transcendent defensive impact can do. And then lastly, the Jason Tatum series against the Celtics in the NBA Finals, they sent him into one of his worst playoff series as a pro. And that just goes to show you like that specific element, having defensive weapons, the caliber of Draymond Green, the caliber of Andrew Wiggins, they can go a long way towards swinging playoff series by causing opposing stars to play well below their capability. I thought last night against Joel Embiid was a great example of that. Like, don't take Draymond Green for granted. Like his ability to impact the game defensively isn't just really good. It's transcendently good. It's top tier in the NBA good, right? The second big takeaway I 
had from this game is that Steph is just back to form now. At 37 on 17 shots. He's averaging 33-5-6 and six on 53% from the field, 48% from three, and 100% from the line over the course of his last five games. Remember, over his previous 23 games, just 25-4-6 and six on 42% from the field, 36% uh, from three, and 92% from the line. So, like, we went from an extended stretch there where Steph was playing below his capability to now we have a two- or three-week stretch here, two, well, two weeks, basically, where Steph looks more or less like the Steph that we know as a matter of fact, playing at an MVP level. And that was just an important checkpoint, right? Like when I talked about the three important things that the Warriors had to accomplish, it's like step one, Steph has to play like Steph Curry, right? Step two, you have to be coherent defensively and, and honestly have to be great defensively with some of the limitations they have in shot creation. And then three, you need backup offensive support, which leads us to the next big takeaway. Andrew Wiggins was awesome in this game against the Sixers. He was getting downhill penetration on Kelly Oubre. He was rising up around the rim and dunking everything on cuts. That's an area where he's been really bad this year. He's been really timid and soft around the basket. And I pulled this data uh, last week, but like uh, before the last couple of games, Andrew Wiggins was down something crazy, like eight or 9% on layups around the basket uh, compared to last year. And so that, that just goes uh, compared to the 2022 season, pardon me. So like, Seeing Andrew just going up with more confidence around the basket as an athlete, like dunking everything, hanging on the rim, just having that like force and power behind his game is super, super encouraging. He had 23 points on 10 shots last night in this uh, four-game stretch uh, after the team took that break, obviously, to grieve the loss of one of their assistant coaches. He's averaging 19 points, five rebounds, and three assists on 63% from the field, 46% from the three-point line, and 2.3 steals and blocks per game. So, like, that's more or less the Andrew Wiggins that we remember from 2022. That's what the Warriors have been getting. And you know what's crazy is the offense has come, but it started in that Atlanta Hawks game with him re-engaging defensively at the point of attack with the job that he did on DeJounte Murray, and he's just kind of ridden that momentum. I've talked about this concept on the show before. I talked about it yesterday, actually. But one of the best ways to get out of a slump is to impact winning elsewhere. Because when you start impact winning else elsewhere, you can feel it. You feel it in your confidence. You know, I am helping my team right now. That relieves pressure when you go to take a shot. And, and Andrew's shooting better from three. Uh, he's made six of his last nine threes. He's making those important kind of weak side wing above the break threes that the Warriors offense can generate for him. And like like the confidence to take those and make those in a lot of, in a lot of ways can come from playing well elsewhere on the floor. And I think you're kind of just seeing momentum, like real positive momentum with Andrew Wiggins. And, you know, I saw a report yesterday, might have been, it was yesterday or two days ago, about the Warriors potentially exploring player-for-player -player swaps uh, involving Andrew Wiggins. I talked about some of them on the show, actually, that I had heard about. Uh, behind the scenes a couple of weeks ago. So like I know that's something that they had explored, but I I've maintained this all season. Like unless you're getting something significant, like a real return, I wouldn't look for like a player for player like another role player type of swap for Andrew Wiggins because as I've said all season, the potential he has to regain what he used to be is far greater than what any potential trade return would be at this point. And so I'm actually very hopeful that the Warriors keep Andrew Wiggins uh, and, and just kind of lean into hoping that he kind of gets back on track the way that he has in the last couple of weeks. And then lastly, on the Warriors front, Jonathan Kaminga has 26. Just a ridiculous highlight, really. He had this transition push against Tobias Harris where he like crossed him over right to left, and Embiid was waiting for him at the rim, and he just went right into Embiid's chest and finished at the rim. There was another one where he kind of slashed from the top of the key, and he took off like he was going to dunk on him and like took the content, uh, contact and then whipped around with like a scoop shot off the glass. It was ridiculous. He's dunking on everyone on these cuts that he ca uh, catches underneath the basket. He's hitting pull-up jump shots. He's hitting above the break threes. He's just, it's outrageous. Like, like we're watching an incredible rise. Remember, Jonathan Kaminga, before this stretch, had never put two 20-point games together in a row. Never. He had never done it. And now he's had seven consecutive 20-plus point nights. Over the seven-game span, Jonathan Kaminga's averaging 62, or excuse me, <laughs> He's averaging 25 points and seven rebounds on 62% from the field and 55% from three, including 1.9 stocks per game. That steals 
plus blocks. So I'm officially at the point with Jonathan Kaminga where you just can't trade this guy. You can't trade him unless you're getting back a legitimate star. And quite frankly, I'm not sure that type of star is available at this deadline. You know, I, I was talking with Samus Fondiari at, in our post-game show after, um, I think it was the Kings game a few nights ago. And we kind of talked about how like the, like, like a Lori Markkinen would be like the minimum allowable kind of quality of player that you'd make a move for. And like, I'm not even sure Lori's enough now. Like, I think this guy's on like a bona fide star trajectory. He's he moves he moves in a way that is not like top tier for the position. He moves in a way that is like like truly uh it's like a unicorn. It's like it's like his unique basketball trait that kind of makes him uh that makes him special compared to other excellent forward prospects that we see in NBA history. It like when you combine that with like the touch and the confidence and the real like relentless downhill motor that he has, I, I don't think you can trade this guy. Not unless you're getting back a legitimate star. Like not, not unless you're getting a, back a guy that makes you actually sit back and think, oh, we have a chance to win the title here. Like if for some reason you could get a player that's like of a like a Paul George's caliber, which obviously you're not because the Clippers are contending for the title, but it would have to be that type of player, a bona fide top 15 player. And, and and I just don't see that out on the market. So I think you hang on to Jonathan Kaminga at this point and you try to make it work with some sort of other ancillary moves on the margins. Looking for a super offer for Super Bowl 58? Well, DraftKings has you covered. New customers can bet on the big game and turn 5 bucks into 200 instantly in bonus bets. The line right now is at San Francisco minus 1.5, but you can bet all sorts of things on the game, even the coin toss, although big shock, it's going to be 50-50 odds there. My brothers and I always place a bunch of bets on the Super Bowl every year. I'm not actually sure what I'm going to do yet, but I'm excited. It should be a great game. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code HOOPS, that's H-O-O-P-S. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get 200 instantly in bonus bets, only on DraftKings Sportsbook an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 58 with code HOOPS. Again, that's H-O-O-P-S. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 8778-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY to 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888 888- 789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. All right, so let's move on to this passive aggressive LeBron stuff. So, first of all, we've had all sorts of reporting behind the scenes for a while. I had heard specifically that uh that LeBron and AD were just done with with Darvin Ham. Uh, at one point in time, that was about a month ago, or uh, earlier in January, I should say, not quite a month ago. Um, but we're seeing all sorts of passive-aggressive stuff. I've seen Anthony Davis walk out of a huddle. I've seen LeBron have really bad body language in a huddle. LeBron, post-game last night, gets cut off by a reporter and goes, like, thanks for stopping me, I was about to go off. He tweets last night this the uh, the hourglass emoji. It It's just a lot of classic LeBron passive-aggressive stuff. So, now, for the record. I do not think that LeBron James is going to leave Los Angeles. His kids are in LA. I think he loves playing for the Lakers. I think he loves the the. I think he loves playing in Crypto.com Arena. I think he loves playing in front of the celebrities. I think he feels the the stage and the in the vibe and the history of the organization. And I think he loves that. And quite frankly, he's going to be in his twenty second season next year. I don't think he's. I don't think he's in a position from an age standpoint to start a new venture. So my opinion is that all of this is classic LeBron stuff just to try to apply pressure on the front office to get a trade done. That's what I think is happening. But we're going to have some fun here. I want to contemplate different examples of opportunities for LeBron to potentially leave the Lakers and go help another team win a championship just for fun. So first of all, what type of team would LeBron help the most? A team with like an opening in that big forward spot, right? To a team that's already in the title mix, right? Like LeBron's not going to leave for another iffy situation, right? That that's that that would serve no purpose. And then lastly, a team that could use size and power on the front line. So specifically, teams that struggle with defensive rebounding, help side defense, uh, interior playmaking, whether it's out of the post or in just an overall like kind of uh, bully ball attack around the basket, like matchup attacking. Those are the kinds of teams that we would be looking at, right? So what I want to do here 
I want to give my top five favorite LeBron James destinations. Now, important caveat here. I'm looking at because uh, I want to make because there's a bunch of different ways this could go down, right? Like LeBron could uh, ask for a trade at this deadline, right? Like LeBron could opt into his new deal and then ask for a trade this summer. That that would probably be like the most likely scenario. If LeBron wanted to leave, he'd probably opt in and ask for a trade because he'd probably want to make sure he gets paid what he deserves. But that would make things really complicated and severely limit the types of teams that could go after him. So I am building this list based purely on the idea of LeBron signing an exception to start with a deal, a uh, start with a team. So whether that's a veteran minimum exception or like the uh, whatever uh, mid-level exception the team has available, depending on their situation with their salary cap, I'm looking at LeBron signing with these teams outright. And I'm going to give you guys my top five here, and I'll explain why I like the move for each team. So number five, the Minnesota Timberwolves. He'd be surrounded by now again, like we're looking at a construct here where you're looking at like Anthony Edwards, Mike Conley, Jaden McDaniels, LeBron James, Rudy Gobert. He'd be surrounded by excellent defensive players and ton of and a ton of regular season motor to just kind of help him over the course of the regular season. He'd be an excellent backline guy without having to overexert himself on that end of the floor. He'd play alongside a young superstar and Anthony Edwards who can carry a good chunk of the offensive load in the regular season. Anthony Edwards too. Kind of reminds me a lot of young LeBron where he just brings an insane amount of athleticism, motor, and competitiveness to every regular season game, which I think would be a great fit there. And then lastly, I think LeBron could help them with late game execution. This was one of the biggest weaknesses for the Timberwolves all season long. Uh, like half court offense, slow down, clutch time offense. That's a specific area where LeBron would be able to help. I think if you add LeBron at the four with the Minnesota Timberwolves, they immediately become a top tier contender. Number four, the Oklahoma City Thunder. He specifically addresses everything they suck at. He's the big forward they don't have on the roster. He would help with defensive rebounding. They have no post presence. As a matter of fact, the Thunder run the third fewest post ups. Uh, in the league and so LeBron to kind of bring that matchup attacking element to that front line that they don't have and he provides the experience and leadership that a team like this would need to navigate a deep playoff run and once again just like we talked about with the Timberwolves a young team with a ton of defense and shot creation and athleticism and motor to carry them through the regular season so important context with number five and number four Minnesota and Oklahoma City are really small markets And so they're extremely unlikely because even in the event that LeBron did decide to move, it's just hard to imagine LeBron being like, I'm going to finish my career in Minnesota, you know, or like, I'm going to finish my career in Oklahoma City. So I am abundantly aware of the fact that those are basically just never, ever, ever going to happen. But as a basketball fan, those are examples of two teams positionally with the way those rosters are constructed that he would be a really good basketball fit with. These last three are like somewhat more legitimate for various reasons. In the in the event that LeBron did choose to leave, these teams actually make sense for him as destinations. So, number three, the Cleveland Cavaliers. Just like Oklahoma City, they don't post up. As a matter of fact, they are one of only two teams in the league that post up less frequently than Oklahoma City. The Cavs are a massive pick-and-roll attack. Tons and tons and tons of spread pick-and-roll. And so they don't really have a lot of diversity in their offense. LeBron would help them a lot with that, just giving them an additional matchup, matchup attacking uh, option as a bully ball forward, right? Secondly, late game execution. The Cavs are the fourth worst clutch offense in the league. LeBron would help them sin- uh, significantly on that front. And again, just the idea of matchup attacking. I love the idea of like a Donovan Mitchell, LeBron James two-man game at the end of games to pick on specific matchups and, and, and to um, generate high-quality shots. And then he could really help with Evan Mobley's development. I think... In the short term, it would be a little complicated because like like Jared Allen is a is is just a better like kind of like center and anchor right now than Evan Mobley, and you don't like the idea of Evan Mobley coming off the bench, right? But like in the long run, you could see better of an, an option where like maybe you can get away with LeBron at the four and Evan Mobley at the five because of LeBron's strength, right? And I think maybe you lean into that sort of thing. But most importantly, it's a place that you could see LeBron actually wanting to end his career. Like, if you heard, oh, LeBron's leaving the Lakers to go back to Cleveland and finish his career there, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that makes some sense just because of LeBron's history in that city, right? Number two, the Golden State Warriors. This is a a fun one. 
Really would help with interior size and strength, which is one of the bigger weaknesses on the roster. Also an alternative playmaker. We've talked about this all season long and extending back into the postseason last year. It just comes down to way too often Steph being the only guy who can generate a quality shot. LeBron would be able to just alleviate some of that for him. Three, he gets to stay in California and be relatively close to his kids. So it makes some logistical sense from the standpoint of where he is at this point in his life. And then lastly, Steph and LeBron playing together would just be really cool. I think they're the two best players of this era. I don't think the roster is talented enough that people would discount any success of those two guys. Like I think if Steph and LeBron won a title together at this phase with Steph turning 36 in March and LeBron being 39 years old, I think it would actually be more of a testament to the greatness of those two rather than some sort of detriment because they did it together, especially with some of the limitations of talent around them. Also, Jonathan Kaminga, with his athleticism and with the shooting that he's demonstrating as of late, shooting over 50% from three over the seven-game span, like I actually think he could theoretically play the three next to LeBron and Draymond Green. And so like just as a basketball fan, I would just I, I think that would be really, really fun to see the two of them play together. And then lastly, our last one, uh, the number one place that I'd like to see LeBron James go if he left the Los Angeles Lakers, the New York Knicks. Another huge market, a franchise with a ton of history. They are legitimately built to win the title. With a couple of uh, a couple of upgrades, just imagine like a significantly better version of Julius Randle, a better shooter, a better matchup attacker, a better defensive player, better attitude, better leader, better all of that stuff, right? And you can imagine, obviously, with Mitchell Robinson being back, like this incredibly physically imposing front line of OG Ananobi, LeBron James, and Mitchell Robinson, alongside an excellent point of attack defender in Dante DiVincenzo and Jalen Brunson. And specifically, the Jalen Brunson fit kind of reminds me of the Kyrie Irving fit with the uh, Cavaliers in the sense that like he's more of like an individual shot creator on an island who also is capable of passing, but Jalen is a guy that like picks on matchups primarily looking to score. And I think that that complements LeBron really, really well. And again, like you can just imagine LeBron potentially enjoying being at Madison Square Garden, enjoying the history, enjoying playing for the celebrity in front of the celebrities, enjoying, you know, trying to to add another chapter to his legacy in reviving the New York Knicks, although they've already kind of started that revival, right? But like, of all of all of the uh, the teams out there, there are a lot of options that make sense. But I thought the New York Knicks had that best balance of like he would get the majority of the credit, and you know how much that matters to LeBron, the history, the franchise, the actual proximity to championship contention. It just makes a lot of sense on that front. All right, let's move on to the mailbag. First question. What do you think is up with Jamal Murray? I figured he would be a good candidate to get his first all-star nod, but does not look likely this year unless there are injuries or some other factor. Clearly, he's a great player and great with great physical tools and skill set who tends to rise to the occasion. But to me, he seems like he just plays to the level of the competition and the moment. So a couple of things. I think for I think it's important to acknowledge that Denver has a lot of offensive talent. So, like, Contavious Caldwell-Pope is a guy who can easily go for 20 in a night, right? Like, he's he can hit jump shots coming off of screens. He's a great transition scorer, spot-up shooter, that kind of thing. Michael Porter Jr. is a guy who can go for 30 on any given night. Aaron Gordon is a guy that, like, I mean, we've seen him literally in the NBA Finals spam post-ups as he goes to work. He's a guy that's got a lot of offensive talent, especially combined with his athleticism. And so I think a lot of times in the regular season on the night in, night out stuff, you see this with Jokic too, where it's like there are nights where like Jamal and and Nikola just don't really have to be aggressive. They don't have to because of the way the regular season pans out. And then what we've seen consistently is anytime there's some sort of significant challenge in front of them, especially when you see Michael Porter start to miss shots, you see KCP start to miss shots, you see Aaron Gordon getting left open and all that stuff. Every single time we've seen that, Jamal and Nikola Jokic, they kind of just have this moment where they're like, hey, it's time for us to take over. And they do. And again, like I understand that there's some frustration on that front as it pertains to the awards and the fact that Jamal Murray deserves more recognition as a player in this league than what his accolades would su- would suggest, right? But if you had to choose between a guy who had all the accolades but couldn't rise to the occasion or a guy that didn't have the accolades but the guy that you trusted to rise to the occasion, which guy would you take? Obviously the second one. I, I'm i happy for Nuggets fans that they get to root for a guy like Jamal Murray. I think he's the perfect co-star for Nikola Jokic. Next question. 
Do you think Torian Prince is being given so much playing time to juice his trade stock? I know his contract isn't as big as, say, D'Lo, but alongside someone else, he could make a desirable offer. Vando and Rui are the playoff wings, but they've had injuries this season. Maybe Ham is thinking of it in a load management sort of way. So uh, the digging I've done behind the scenes uh, uh, would lead me to believe that the Lakers are primarily prior- prioritizing uh, Torian Prince because of his shooting. Just a, 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 it's a simple uh, a simple a concept of spacing. He shoots 39% from three, and I think they're just kind of keeping it at that level. But there's no legitimate basketball reason for Torian Prince to be starting at the three. Historically in the NBA, he's been a bench player. I mentioned this stat the other day. Torian Prince has started more than twice as many games this season as he has in the previous three seasons combined. He's a bench wing. Perfectly fine bench wing, but he's being asked to do more than he's capable of right now. I I was doing uh, lineup data stuff for the Cleveland Cavaliers video that I'm doing later today with Carter Rodriguez, and I found this gem for you guys. There are 22 five-man lineups in the NBA that have played at least 200 minutes this year. The D'Angelo Russell, Austin Reeves, Torian Prince, LeBron James, the uh, Anthony Davis lineup is being outscored by four and a half points per 100 possessions, which is the second worst mark in that entire list, literally 21st out of 22 teams. So like there is an extensive bit of evidence that that lineup does not work for everything. Darvin Ham is focusing on, on the spacing side of things. It is a basic misunderstanding of the way the modern NBA works in the modern NBA. There is a ton of perimeter speed and athleticism and teams are trying to drive and kick you to death once they get into rotation, whether it's through the post or whether it's through pick and roll, you need perimeter speed, you need perimeter strength. And the Lakers have perimeter speed and strength in the form of Jared Vanderbilt in the form of Max Christie, right? Like they have guys that can do that sort of thing. They need more. Like I, I'm a big believer that even the Jared Vanderbilt in the starting lineup situation has some playoff limitations. And that's why I think a trade needs to be made. And that's why I'm kind of withholding any sort of big picture evaluation of the Lakers until that point. But the bottom line is that three man grouping with Torian at the three very clearly is not good enough. They can't defend. They can't rebound. It's a huge problem. They're bad on offense. They're bad on defense. They're bad on the glass. It's like even, even the spacing concepts that the Lakers are envisioning with Torian Prince at the three are not coming to fruition. The offense is not good with that five-man grouping. And it has nothing to do with Torian making shots. Torian Prince has had 10 games this year where he's made at least four threes. The Lakers lost his minutes in six of those 10 games. They're minus 20 in those 10 games. So even uh, in in Torian's minutes in those 10 games. So even when Torian's got the three-point shot going, it's not helping them. It is legitimately one of the most – like. It is legitimately one of the worst consistent coaching decisions I've seen made in a, in a very long time. There are better basketball players than Torian Prince on the roster right now, even if we acknowledge the Lakers need to make a trade. And Darvin Ham is deliberately handicapping the team by starting every single game in half with a lineup that is doomed to fail. And, and, and I, I don't really know what else to say. I this is a consensus around the league, not just with Lakers fans, but with non-Lakers fans. All of the data clearly demonstrates this, and Darvin Ham is either completely oblivious to it or he just doesn't care. And, and and it's 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 truly confounding to me. Next question. As a dubs fan, Ant-Man versus Shea Gilgis Alexander looks and feels like the new version of MJ versus Reggie. Both are great in their own way at the guard spot, and both are absolutely insane. I 100 percent agree. I was actually thinking about this this morning. Like, they're so different. Like, Ant is this incredible athlete who plays with a ton of power and verticality, while Shea is like this thinner, longer player who brings physicality to the position, but it's much more finesse and skill-oriented. And so it's one of my favorite things about the game of basketball. Two guys that basically play the same position, that are basically even the same height, but that just play fundamentally different brands of basketball. I think, you guys know me, you guys know the way that I see the game. I am always going to lean more towards that strength and power. And so like, even though SGA may or may not be a better player right now, I think when we fast forward five years, it's far more likely that Anthony Edwards is a more impactful playoff player because he brings that two-way element. Uh, Not that Shea's not a good defender, but Ant's just a better defensive player. And he just has that strength and power element that he can inflict on the game. 
Next question. Chet has been so confusing to me on offense. When he's wide open for three, he's been pump faking and looking to drive, but when he takes contested ones in the heat of the game, he tends to hit them. Seems like as much as he still has to develop, he is also in his head a bit right now. Would love to see him just take these open ones. So I've noticed this as well, and it's a it's a classic young player thing. Young players uh, are, are have a lot harder time seeing the forest for the trees. I know this because I was a young player once, obviously. And like, what, I talk about this concept all the time. Young players struggle to identify what works and keep doing it, and they struggle to identify what's not work, working and stop doing it. It's a it's they they have a hard time seeing the bigger picture of basketball. And so the reason why he hits the contested one seemingly, a big part of that is you just don't have much time to think about it. If it's a late clock situation and the ball ends up in your hands and a catch and shoot five on the shot clock that's relatively contested, but it's like the best shot your team can get on that possession, you just rise and fire. You don't think about it. And it can be the open ones that get in your head a little bit. But the bottom line is, is like, it would be really bizarre if we saw a kid his age that just was consistently great on a night in night out basis, month in month out basis. This is part of the growing pains of being a young basketball player. Next question. Mailbag, love the show. Where's your rookie of the year so far? Or who's your rookie of the year so far this season? I'm a Spurs fan, so obviously I think Victor is. Your thoughts. So I agree it's Victor. A couple of different reasons for that. Like Chet's role with the Thunder is very different. Um, he's playing on a great team and getting set up with great opportunities as he's playing alongside great ball handlers. And that's not to say that Chet's not playing really well. Of course he is, and I'm a huge believer in Chet in the big picture. But Victor is playing on a team with some of the worst ball handling you'll ever see. And the, the bottom line is I just think I just think Victor is a little bit better as a basketball player. And I think he's showing that. The most encouraging trend so far this season for the um, – uh, for Victor is the uptick in his efficiency. In his first 21 games this year, he only shot 43% from the field. And as a team, they went 3-18. and 18. In their last 20 games, Victor is averaging 22 points and 10 rebounds and 4 assists, 50% from the field, 35% from 3, 60% true shooting, and they're 7-13. and 13. They're actually just a shade under 500. So you're just seeing really good progress on that front. Also, there just aren't that many rookies in NBA history that walk in and average 20 points a game. I think that's significant. I think he's easily the rookie of the year at this point. Do you have a favorite move slash counter move combo from a specific player? So uh, I have a lot of, just like any basketball player, I have a lot of specific like moves and combos that I picked up from people. There's a, like, I have a lot of my in and out step backs are, I stole from Damian Lillard. A lot of the footwork that I use on step back threes comes from James Harden. A lot of the, uh, like off the dribble, like combination stuff into pull up jump shots. I've, I've stolen from Paul George, but the biggest one that I would say my favorite uh, is because my my biggest asset as a basketball player is my size and strength. I weigh 225, 230 pounds, depending on the depending on how much vacation I've been on lately and how much I've been eating and drinking. But I weigh a lot of I weigh a lot. I have long arms and I'm about six six. So uh, with that being the case, like I play like a power back to the basket game against smaller guards when they try to guard me on the perimeter. And so the big one for me has been uh, and this this is actually something I built out over COVID. Uh, because it was not a part of my game when I was younger. But like basically just a back-to-the-basket combination of right-to-left shoulder fades. So I have a drill that I do every single day. And I basically start on the left block, spin the ball out to myself, and I shoot a left shoulder fade, and I shoot a right shoulder fade. Then I go to the opposite block, and I shoot a left shoulder fade, and I shoot a right shoulder fade. And I keep going until I make them. And then I go through that cycle four t uh, five times. So I make 20 total turnaround fadeaways 10 over each shoulder and I, I I say Kawhi because like I steal like the contact oriented element of it like a lot of people take tough fadeaway shots that are more athleticism oriented where they're like covering a ton of ground and jumping really high mine's more of like a I'm hitting you with my shoulder and I'm trying to create space so I can spin into it and more or less go straight up and down and like that ended up being huge for me because when I was younger I um I was a lot of off the dribble stuff from the perimeter, especially pull up threes and, and and trying to slash off of that. I played a lot like more like Paul George at that phase in my career or my basketball life, I should say, because obviously I'm not a pro. But like the uh, uh, what ended up happening is a lot of the teams and players in town would start sticking smaller, quicker guards on me to press up and test my handle and quickness. And so 
it was important for me to build out a back to the basket game to counter that. And now it's like no team will put a small guard on me because I'll just take him down to the post every single time. And so that's been a, a definitely my favorite move counter move combo is like, I'm hitting you with that shoulder. And if you're overplaying the right side, I'm spinning off into that left shoulder fade. If you're playing me straight up, I'm spinning into that right shoulder fade. And then obviously important uh, caveat. I do not think I'm a professional basketball player in the NBA. This is just simply talking the game because I love the game and I still play the game and I still love playing the game. All right. Next question. I'm a football fan through and through first, but I've been watching basketball a lot more and thoroughly enjoying it as I learn more, uh, as I learn about the more techno parts. With this in mind, we've seen the Celtics team be one of the best teams for the last three years now, and with those three years not resulting in a single championship. I understand a championship is hard to get, but if I compare it to football, it's like the Ravens versus the Chiefs. Number one seed, but can never punch it in. Is there a point in being such a good team if you've never won anything from it? And can you eventually write a team off if they can't punch it in in the postseason. So first of all, fun, uh, football and, and, and basketball are fundamentally different in the way that like a quarterback, a quarterback can impact winning, right? Like Aaron Rodgers, in my opinion, is the second best quarterback of that era, that Tom Brady era, right? And he just didn't have nearly as much playoff success because of all the different moving parts in an 11-man unit on offense, in an 11-man unit on defense, right? Like, we've even seen Patrick Mahomes. It's like, oh, you have a couple of injuries on your offensive line. Now you're running for your life, and a Tampa Bay Buccaneers team with a pretty limited version of Tom Brady beats you, right? Like, we, we've seen how that can happen. So basketball is more, more uh, uh, a sport where the best player can impact the outcome. And, you know, as much as, like, as much as I have frustrations with the Celtics, the reason why I could never be done with them is Tatum is still relatively young. Like it, like most of these guys don't really figure it out on the biggest stages until they're 27, 28 years old. You know, every once in a while you'll get a, a guy like a Jokic, you'll get it at 26. But it's like, for the most part, it's that 26, 27, 28, 29 where they start to figure it out. And like Tatum's just now entering into that phase of his career. And so I think it'd be foolish to punt on that core until they at least have a few chances with Jason Tatum in the heart of his prime. Next question, three more. You often talk about the Lakers' ability to turn it on in the playoffs, how their size and experience will be key in a Wolves or Thunder hypothetical matchup. But at what point does a size and experience advantage become a disadvantage? At what point do the big veteran Lakers become the slow old Lakers and the young, inexperienced Thunder slash Wolves become the youthful, hungry, and spry Thunder slash Wolves. Eventually, these advantages slash disadvantages are going to flip in favor of the younger teams. You obviously think that that, that won't happen this postseason, but if not this season, then when? LeBron in 40, AD is a 30-year-old big man with a lot of mileage. The same also applies to teams like the Suns, Warriors, and the Bucks and their younger counterparts, the Kings, the Pelicans, and the Magic. So first of all, did you, uh, you guys want to hear a fun fact? Did you know that the Oklahoma City Thunder have only two players on the roster that are 30 years old or, or older? That is Davis Bertans and Vasily J. Misic, if I remember correctly. Uh, guess who else only has two 30-year-old players on the roster? The Los Angeles Lakers. Every single player on that roster that's not LeBron James and Anthony Davis is less than 30 years old. And Anthony Davis is only 30 years old. The specific issue for the Lakers is they actually have a lot of youth and athleticism. Like, Ruby Hachimura is an excellent athlete at that power forward position. Jared Vanderbilt is an excellent athlete at that power forward position. Max Christie, Cam Reddish are excellent athletes at the two-guard position. Jackson Hayes is an excellent athlete at the center position. And more is just the, the Lakers have this, uh, uh, have this issue where the actual – guys that are playing for them are not great athletes. Austin Reeves and D'Angelo Russell at this point kind of have to play because of uh, the way the roster is organized, but their issue is they play guys like Austin, D'Lo, Torian Prince, massive minutes, and they're not great athletes. And so even though they're young, they run into athleticism and there's a problem. And especially when LeBron James isn't engaged defensively. And I've said this many times on the show, but the reality is, is LeBron's defensive engagement has been the primary culprit of the Lakers defensive issues. Like I can't tell you how many times I'm watching on tape and I'm like, Oh, LeBron could have made a play there as the low man. And he just chose not to. And so 
one of the big reasons why the Lakers have been so good in like big time games on uh, against big time opponents and then so bad in other situations is like LeBron just engages himself defensively and suddenly the Lakers look more coherent defensively and 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 that goes a long way. The Lakers have actually been one of the top 10 defenses in the league this year against the top 10 offenses in the league. The Lakers defense goes up a level when they play better teams. My concern with the Lakers is are they going to be able at this deadline to turn one of those skill, non-athletic players that's at the top end of the rotation, swap them out for a more athletic version of that type of rotation player, which is why I keep going back to players like a like a, uh, a DeJounte Murray or Bruce Brown. I've also seen like Royce O'Neal, Dorian Finney-Smith, potential combinations coming from the Brooklyn Nets. If they can find a way to turn their top part of their rotation, the guys that aren't LeBron and AD, but the guys right below that, into a more athletic group that is also capable of scoring the basketball or making shots, that would go a long way towards alleviating some of their issues. But yeah, the Lakers have a lot of issues. Age isn't one of them. They are not an old team. They're LeBron is old, and that's it. It's it's a hundred percent an issue with the guys they play are primarily too unathletic, and so they have to find a way to balance their rotation so that there's a little bit less of the offensive skill and a little bit more of the power and force. All right, two more questions. When the Pacers traded for Siakam, I thought it was a great move, but I still think they're a move away, a significant move from being a contender. In your opinion, would you trade for Mikhail Bridges to make them a contender? I understand the Pacers would have to give up Jarris Walker, their recent lottery pick, who has a high upside, but I think the move would be worth it. A starting lineup of Halley, Matherin, Bridges, Siakam, Turner could make the Pacers contenders next season. What do you think? So, I, I remind me if I'm wrong about this, but when I reacted to this Yakum trade, I think I might have pitched a Mikhail Bridges trade. I, I can't quite remember. I don't want to take credit for it if I'm wrong, but I vaguely remember saying something along those lines. I really like that fit there. That's a positional archetype they don't have. They've got, you know, Aaron Neesmith is the kind of perimeter oriented forward on the team, but the problem with Aaron Neesmith is he's just a little bit on the short side. Um, I tend to like Aaron Neesmith still. Because I think he's kind of in that Bruce Brown archetype of like kind of lower center of gravity, lots of strength, really physical at the point of attack, which I find to be very valuable, especially in a playoff setting. He also can shoot the ball and he can slash off of catch and shoot situations. So like I I, I like Aaron Neesmith, but there's no doubt that Mikhail Bridges would just be a much better version of that uh, of that archetype, more length, uh, more offensive pop. It, like a legitimate, you know, third creator next to Siakam and Halliburton. I really like that setup. As far as championship contention goes, it's all about playoff lumps for me. Like, Nikola Jokic didn't win the title his first run through the playoffs. That dude has been in wars. He lost to Anthony Davis, lost to the Warriors twice. Like, he's been to the playoffs a bunch of times. He's been in those wars, right? It took lots of loss and building of scar tissue, the hatred of losing to get to the point where he succeeded in 2023. And the same goes for Giannis. The same goes for every single one of these guys. There are lumps along the way. You don't just walk into the playoffs and start winning. So regardless of what the roster is, and this is a big believer, this is why I'm a big believer in getting there sooner than later. You want to get him to take those lumps, a Tyrese Halliburton meaning. And so like, I think, I, I think, I love that idea, but the idea of them contending right away, I would think they would need to take a loss or two in the postseason for them to actually get to the level of commitment they would need to win the title. All right, last question. Hey, Jason, a quick hypothetical mailbag. A lot of people have Tatum over LeBron in their player rankings. However, I firmly believe the Celtics would have won with LeBron in 2022 and maybe even in 2023. What are your thoughts on this? So there's a huge difference uh, between like, ranking players for the entire campaign from training camp through the trophy to, okay, we're healthy and we're starting a seven game series tomorrow or playoff run tomorrow. Right. And I actually talked about this in the, uh, in my, um, uh, uh, player rankings this last summer. And I actually said in my player rankings, I think LeBron is a better playoff player than Jason Tatum when he's healthy, but I think Jason Tatum has a much better chance of being healthy when we get there. And we actually saw last year LeBron, even though he got through the regular season, he got to the playoffs and he was hobbled. And so, like, I tend to agree that I would take LeBron in a playoff setting over Jason Tatum. He's just more experienced. He just, and at this point, he's just, <laughs> LeBron's better than he was last year, even. But there's no doubt that Jason Tatum is a better player for the 82 just because of his youth and his uh, his ability to kind of withstand the grind of the 82-game season at this point. All right, guys, that's all I have for today, or I should say all I have for this show. We're coming back later today with Carter Rodriguez to talk Cavs. I will see you guys then.